So let's talk about 2032, because that's what this is all about. All of you are thinking about the future. My, my, one of my mentors at Wharton, where I got my MBA, was a guy named Bill Kissick. He wrote a book 45 years ago called Medicine's Dilemmas, Infinite Needs, Finite Resources. Sound familiar? And he was the first one to talk about that iron triangle of access, quality, and cost. And if you remember ninth grade geometry, you increase one angle, you decrease another. So he said, look, it's just math. If you want to increase access, you either have to increase cost or decrease quality, and you can go all around that circle, unless you're willing to disrupt the system and disruption is painful. He said 45 years ago, if anybody ever tells you going to increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and it's not going to be painful, you can't be telling the truth. So this is a great quote. This is probably the one thing to remember if you're thinking about healthcare. That disruption means threatening your existing product line, your past investments. Breakthrough products disrupt current lines of business. So think about it. Why are, why are health system CEOs depressed? Because everybody, if any of you are in the founder world, how do I get, how do I get people out of hospitals? You know, hospital to home, healthcare at any address. Well, that's great unless, unless you're running a hospital system. I, uh, I, I was the advisor for Apple in 20, 2000 and 2001, and what Steve Jobs talked about is the old math being computers and operating system, the new math being this new thing called digital, digital lifestyle. The interesting thing was he took money from the old math of computers and operating systems to the new math. When I got to Jefferson, we did the same thing. We said the old math is inpatient revenue, outpatient revenue, in-person tuition, and NIH funding. The new math is gonna be creative partnerships with, with digital founders, and that's what happened. When I got to Jefferson in 2013, I made some statements that were basically thinking the way that Steve would have thought, what's gonna be obvious in healthcare 10 years from now that we can start doing today at Jefferson? I felt that we'd be paid based on quality, cost, patient experience and outcomes, not just bringing a lot of sick people into the hospital that our hospital stays would be commoditized, which was where most of our revenue came from. It took us a lot of time to get doctors and nurses to work together. Now we're gonna to have to get doctors and robots to work together. Oh, and by the way, if we're gonna have robots, why do we select medical students based on being able to, to memorize something that's gonna be better done on my iPhone? And how can we turn population health, predict analytics, and social determinants from this sort of philosophy to, to mainstream? We didn't have where we were in U.S. News Report or how great our hospital was. Basically what it said, and I had a little sign, said when five years from now, when Elon Musk brings people from Mars to Philadelphia and says, where's Jefferson? I hope you can't define that. I hope you'll say, do you mean Jefferson my home or Jefferson on my iPhone or Android or Jefferson in Israel? Oh, you mean the place where really, really, really sick people go? I think that's still a tenth of Walmart. The problem in healthcare in 2023 is we still define ourselves by where we fail to keep people healthy. What this means, I think the really thing to look at is this piece. Where, where are, where, where's their investment? Virtual care, home care, next-gen primary care, retail clinics, intensive models for high-cost populations, non-hospital delivery sites, and then integrated insurance products. You're not seeing anything about building new towers for hospitals, and I think in five years, literally almost all of those will end up being repurposed. There was a study that a thousand hospitals would close if they weren't being repurposed because other than surgical or ICU pieces, there's just literally no way to, to get any operating income from a hospital. So that revolution is happening. Um, the patients are finally having their mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. If any of you have been in the hospital will relate to this cartoon, literally, you know, you need to get your rest, by the way, we'll, We'll, we'll get you up every hour to do your blood pressure, which makes absolutely no sense, by the way. It was just something that was done in, in the 60s. So, and, and this is a Harris poll that came out literally about six months ago, and it's really scary. Um, it, you, you can read it, but the one that really, really bothered me is that 62% of the respondents said the healthcare experience feels like it's intentionally set up to be confusing. I wish we were that smart. It's not, that's not true. Uh, we don't do that, but the fact is, unlike any other sector, and, and I was, we were talking that the World Economic Forum, right before COVID hit, one of the heads of the global banking system said, you know, 40 years ago, the two sectors that escaped the consumer revolution were banking and healthcare. And he took a sip of his coffee and said, now you're alone. So that's where I got to where I am today. I met this individual named Hey Montanasia, who was the managing partner of um, General Catalyst. And we met through a series of events. And he had just written a book called Unscaled that basically, because they were the initial investors in Airbnb, Warby, Parker, and Stripe. And think about the common denominator there. Used to be, if you wanted to build a lot 
bigger uh, hospital chain than Marriott, you have to build a hell of a lot of hotels. Airbnb just connected people. Warby Parker looked at lens crafters and said, instead of building other shops and malls, let's bring them together. And Stripe did that for the, for, for, for the financial industry. So we got together and said, is there a corollary to that in healthcare? And we wrote a book called Unhealthcare, a Manifesto for Health Assurance. Of what if we took the unscaled philosophy and took costly sick care into affordable, personalized, and preemptive care now that we're going to be living in a world of genomic sensors and, and AI-based digital therapies. And I use this one because I'm an obstetrician, and one of the companies I was on the board of was, was looking at um, a remote obstetric monitoring. And I, it hit me because my daughter got pregnant during the pandemic, and she called me up. She needed three non-stress tests because she had something called preeclampsia uh, a week. And she said, Dad, I had to spend $35 to park three times a week go to a place with a whole lot of sick people, go in an elevator so somebody could slap a monitor on me for a couple hours. I thought you were the digital dude. Can't you take care of that? Well, this company, Nubo, literally was doing that, but because of some malpractice issues and stuff, it was hard to get in the United States. Now, you might say for Jill, it was an inconvenience, but literally, we have one of the highest neonatal intensive care uh, 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 issues in the, in, in the world, and it's partly because Jill could spend that $35 three times a week and come to the hospital. But if you're an essential worker or if you can't afford a nanny, you're just not getting those tests because we haven't made them convenient. So we tried to look at a, a model outside of, outside of the iron triangle of healthcare. What would the patient diamond of health assurance be? Well, people want to be able to thrive, whether they have congestive heart failure, diabetes, cancer, whatever. They want to be able to thrive and not have health get in their way. When they need human relationships, they want to have those human relationships. Otherwise, they want to just have it be invisible. They want to be able to easily navigate on their own terms. And they, under, they want to be able to understand what they need to do and what it will cost. The new, and to us, the new marketing is this. How do you guide consumers by giving them the information they need to make good decisions about their health? And then how do you inspire loyalty by literally creating this seamless model starting at home? So the way we always looked at it with Jefferson General Catalyst is if people join the Jefferson Club while they're healthy, then they have the app for that. So when they have horribly a, a disease, they're not going to go up and down the expressway and see who has the coolest billboard. They're going to say, hey, this is the easiest way for me to get into it. So how do we, how do we change the industry by having humans be humans and robots be robots? Well, one of the weird things is... And this is one of the things I'm working on with Sheba Medical Center because we're starting a new medical school in Israel is we still choose doctors in 2023 based on science GPA, med cats, and organic chemistry performance. And somehow we're just amazed that doctors aren't more empathetic, communicative, and creative, right? So we started the first medical school in the country where we chose students based on self-awareness, empathy, communication skills, and cultural competence. We erased all the, all the objective criteria for those 56 students a year uh, for that program. And this was one of the criteria. We would bring them to the art museum and show them this. So what do you see? I see a woman in a white dress, a guy in a black turtleneck, and a snake. Okay, yeah, okay. Well, what's it emoting to you? What's your, what's your feeling? What's the story? Um, the story is there's a guy in a black turtleneck, a woman in a white dress, and a snake. Then there are others that could tell the story. And you might say, Steve, you know, why? and by the way, it doesn't matter what the story is, uh, but you might say, why does that matter? I've delivered about 2,000 deliveries, and 2,000 babies in my career, and it's pretty easy delivering a normal eight-pound baby to a normal 28-year-old. Easy for me to say. I'm on the other end, so let me, let me rephrase that. Um, it, it's, it's medically easy. It's incredibly difficult delivering an unscheduled Down syndrome baby. And 100% of the time, the first question that moms ask is, doctor, what does it mean? And I've watched good obstetricians talk about the 21st chromosome or the medical complications. I've watched great obstetricians recognize that what does it mean means what does it mean to my image of a perfect baby. And right away we'll say, this is a beautiful baby and I'll get you together with other people who have had beautiful babies like that. I'm a pilot and every two years I have to get my technical competence assessed. Nobody has ever checked my surgical competence or any, any doctor's surgical competence since my age in Boston, Philadelphia, San Francisco. Literally, nobody has ever checked that competence. So you're a hell of a lot safer flying with me than being operated by me, at least by objective criteria. So literally, um, we really start to look at simulation and how we can learn from our mistakes. None of this works if you can't get the physicians that run the system, who have predominantly been trained in a very, very different model to, to change their culture. 
So Jefferson, we call, start something called JOLT, Jefferson Onboarding Leadership Transformation, that literally went and, and assumed that anybody that was over 45 and a physician grew up in a very, very different environment. <laughs> the first thing that we did is, when I graduated from Wharton, I had gotten a, a very large grant to look at what makes doctors different than, depending on the audience, either other people or normal people and how we handle change. And in, in 2020, we redid that, that study, and we found that 70% of the physicians that are practicing three years or less felt really that we, we did a lousy job, in essence. They said, thanks a lot. I have $250,000 worth of debt, and you taught me half of what I need to know. You taught me a lot of biochemistry, microbiology, anatomy. I'm not a physician scientist at Yale. I'm an I'm a OBGYN or a primary care doc in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Oh, you didn't teach me how to manage change, negotiations, healthcare financing. You didn't teach me I'm a part of a large group, how to be an individual in an organization, or anything about all this new stuff like robotics, genomics, drones, or even how to make patients happy or communicate. And that's really what I'm doing now. We did a national study, and this was almost amazingly homogenous. Just looking at who we were even getting to, what we found is 20% of the medical staff gets it. They like you, you like them, you know, it's great. 15% will never get it, and then there's the 65% in the middle. What was fascinating was we found as leaders, we spend about 40% of our time with the folks that get it, because they like us, and we like them, and we feel good with each other. We spend literally 45% of the time with the folks that will never get it, because they're loud and we can cure anybody, and the least amount of time with the people in the middle that'll change the culture. So at Jolt, what we did is we had the people that get it teach the teachers, spent less time with them. We ignored the folks that'll never get it. We called that administrative hospice. We just let them be comfortable and hopefully go off to a competitor. And then we concentrated with the people in, in the middle. And this is what we found. We found that literally major changes over seven years in competency development, readiness for leadership roles, and even, even in physician burnout, and a 325% improvement in dealing with, with difficult issues and situations of a study we just published uh, for Sloan Medical Review. So literally, the ability to start to, to change those models. And then the last thing is just looking at how, as I, as I put in the DJ part of this, how we start to think about healthcare differently. How many of you come from the VC world or the founder world? Okay. Well, maybe it's true in, 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 um, in real estate also, but in our world, 12 to 18 months from the time a health system decides to use one of our products to the time they can get it through that, that, that bureaucracy. And we had brought in a group from Amazon to literally look at how we organize for innovation once we started to change. And there were some really interesting uh, pieces. Obviously, the culture, uh, really trying to bring some people from outside of healthcare uh, so that we can get more innovative thinking. But one of the things that really helped is, is in getting rid of the uh, bureaucracy, what they used to call it Amazon, don't have any project uh, that goes beyond a two pizza team. And the concept of a two pizza team is get people together, uh, just the right amount of people that can consume two pizzas so that it's agile, give them, give them the opportunity to come up with the plan and then own and run what you build. The concept behind disagree and commit is you ha at healthcare, you have the argument. If, if they know that I'm for it, everybody's going to say, yeah, OK, we're going to do that. Right, everybody? We're going to do that? Cabinet? Yeah. And then I'd leave. And then literally, folks will get together. We're not really going to do that, right? We're going to do everything we can to obfuscate or, or stop that. And that's, that's really the, the healthcare culture that literally, at least what we were able to do through bringing in some of these folks to, to get rid of. And then the last thing is, how do we really make sure that all of this innovation, that $30 billion in that previous slide, isn't just making the, the wealthy healthier? Um, and we've created, and part of our unhealthcare book was really looking at responsible innovation. How can we make sure that we're doing well and doing good? How do we create strong, sustainable partnerships between technology? How do we apply data and technologic advances to deliver the best supportive and least intensive care pos possible? How do we really allow this technology to recenter the relationship between provider and patient? How do we get some kind of alignment between the payer, provider, and patient system? And how do we segment our consumers so that the 98% of the people, well, even if they have a chronic disease, can really move forward? Um, I'll, I'm going to leave you with, um, with, with two quotes. One is from uh, uh, one of my mentors, this little green guy. Uh, because without getting docs to be more creative, 
They are doomed. You must make sure that the conference happens. Steve Clasco, an OBGYN doc from Philadelphia, will talk about creativity as a skill set. He will. That program will produce doctors who go home and defeat the dark side of non-creative health care. That group became the core group for an optimistic future. Yes. Learn what you can from the OBGYN doctor. And may the forceps be with you. Mm. And most importantly, and I think, I think the one thing that, that, that I'm pretty passionate about, and I think that COVID proved, is we really, really, really have to start now because it's really embarrassing to have a healthcare system like the one we have today. So thank you very much and thanks for the invitation.